Hello and welcome to our evening service at Charlotte Chapel. It's so great uh, to have you join us this evening. For those of you who maybe don't know me, my name is James Russell and I serve as one of the pastors in training at Charlotte Chapel. This evening, Ashley Gardner, our other pastor in training, he's going to uh, pick up where we left off in our series in Revelation. And our text tonight is Revelation 21, uh, 9 to 27. Maybe you want to get that open in front of you so you're ready for our Bible reading in just a few moments. First Chronicles 16 recalls the moment that David returns the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem after it had been captured by the Philistines. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was where the mercy seat was. This was the altar where sacrifices could be made and sins could be atoned for and the people could be forgiven. So this meant that once again, the people of Israel could be made right with God. So of course, this was a moment of massive celebration. It was an occasion marked with widespread praise and adoration for God throughout Israel. And I want to read uh, to you now um, just some of the instructions David gave to Asaph, who was his chief musician, and to all those who were involved in leading the people in praise. Um, and that's going to help us as we come to offer our own praises. So First Chronicles 16 says this, beginning at verse 23. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvellous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendour and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his dwelling place. Ascribe to the Lord all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendour of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea resound in all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let the trees of the forest sing. Let them sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Cry out, save us, God our Saviour. Gather us and deliver us from the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. As we sing our opening song tonight, let's thank God for all his marvellous deeds. Let's thank God for his wonderful salvation. Let's remember that a much greater sacrifice has been made. We can rejoice in the sacrifice of the Lamb of God when Jesus Christ died for our sins on the cross and rose again so that we could be forgiven and made right with God. Let's praise and thank him for that now as we sing, How Great Is Our God.
come before the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening and we acknowledge that you alone are worthy of all praise. You alone are the one who is great and greatly to be praised. Lord, the highest reason for that is that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to save sinners like us. Lord God, we can't comprehend your love and your mercy, that you yourself would walk among us in the person of the Lord Jesus, that he would give up his life on the cross so that our sin and shame could be forgiven. Lord God, we thank you that you rose him from the dead and that means we have a living hope and we can trust that one day we too will be raised to eternal life. Lord, when we think about that and what you did to save us from our sin, Lord, we can't help but realise that so often we aren't living as we should be. So Lord, we come to you and confess that our hearts don't love you as they should. Lord, so often we miss the mark and fail to obey your word as we should. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would please forgive us. And we thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit to help us tackle our sinful attitudes and thoughts and actions and to bear spiritual fruit. Lord, would we be so aware of what he wants to do in us and would we listen to him? Help us to live as those who follow and serve you. Help us to live in the light of eternity and not be seduced by the things of this world. And Lord, we also pray that just as David is saying, that we would declare your glory among the nations. We pray that we would be people who are ready to proclaim the gospel wherever we go. Lord, as this nation seems increasingly far away from you, we know that you're a God who can do anything and can save anyone. And so we ask that we would see more and more people coming to know you. We ask that this tide of secularism that wants to pervert the truth would be turned back. And we pray that you would change the hearts of our leaders, or Lord, that you would replace them with godly ones. And in this country where you have placed us, would you help us to be bold and courageous and entirely resolved to stand firm for the truth of the gospel, no matter the cost. Finally, Father, as we come to open your word this evening, we want to pray for Ashley. Lord, thank you for the gifts and abilities you've blessed him with and for the encouragement that he is. And Lord, we thank you for what you've laid upon his heart this week. And we pray that you would help us now as we listen. Would you comfort and challenge us with what you have to say? And we pray all of this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. At this point in our service, Izzy Boshoff and Anna McDougall are going to bring us our Bible reading from Revelation 21. And after that, we're going to go straight into the sermon. So let's hand over to Izzy and Anna now. Revelation 21 verse 9 to 27. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone like with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates and with twelve angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be twelve thousand stadia in length, and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as brass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendour into it. 
On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory of honor, the glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Winter is a slog at times, and it feels particularly long, especially with lockdown. Uh, but this week, uh, if you remember on Wednesday, saw heights of 10 degrees. We had uh, warm sunshine, blue skies, um, and there's something about the breakthrough of a sunny day during winter months that not only reminds us that winter will actually come to an end, but actually it creates in us an anticipation and a joy actually uh, about those beautiful warm months of summer just around the corner. We've been preaching through the book of Revelation and, and this truth, the book of Revelation, is the summer sun that breaks through the winter of our world of suffering and brokenness and it reminds us not only that this world will come to an end, that pain and sorrow will be done away with. But actually it reminds us of what's to come, that this future is more glorious than we can ever imagine. If someone were to ask you, what is the big story of the Bible? What's the big overarching message? I wonder what it is that you'd say. Here's my stab at it. The glorious thread that runs through from Genesis to Revelation is about the triune God who, despite the rebellion and failure of his creatures, in love rescues and redeems a people by his grace. Why? In order that they might live for his glory and he might dwell amongst them. I'll say that again. It's that the triune God who, despite the rebellion and failure of his creatures, in love rescues and redeems a people by his grace. Why? In order that they might live for his glory and he might dwell amongst them. This golden thread, God present with his people, is weaved throughout the pages of the Bible from Adam and Eve's garden temple, in paradise to the glory uh, of the tabernacle and the temple in the land of Israel in the Old Testament through to, to the church, the people of God from every tribe and tongue and nation where God by his spirit dwells. And the book of Revelation in many ways climaxes these themes like, like a symphonic piece of music uh, that's been weaving and building to its crescendo or like the tributaries uh, weaving their way through a particular land until they, they coalesce and meet in a great river. All the threads of God's plans and purposes are coming to glorious completion. In chapter 21, we're reaching the climax, not only of John's vision itself, but of history and time. It's the Apostle John who, who penned the letter of Revelation and, and if John was using the Harvard referencing system he would no doubt place a footnote at the bottom of this section that we're just about to go through referencing Ezekiel the prophet, River Kebar, 550 BC. Because Ezekiel's final vision, particularly chapters 40 to 48, uh, they actually serve as a grid or a, or a template that John develops. In Ezekiel, um, he sees a glimpse of the cosmic realities uh, of the new land of Israel, which represents God's place, of a renewed priesthood, which represents God's people under God's rule, uh, and most importantly, the, the new temple, filled with the God's glory, which represents God's divine presence. Uh, and by the Spirit of God, John has this picture revealed in its fullness. You see, what, what Ezekiel saw in 2D, John now sees in, in 4D Technicolor. And here's the big theme of this passage. It's finally the presence of God and the Lamb dwell perfectly in the temple city 
amongst their glorified people as they serve him forever. It's finally the presence of God and the Lamb dwell perfectly in the temple city amongst their glorified people as they serve him forever. And we're going to break down this passage under three headings. So firstly, looking at verses 9 to 14, God's people permanently perfected and unified. God's people permanently perfected and unified. John's vision of this this bridal city continues. We've already seen this picture in uh, chapter 21, verse 2, uh, and it continues here. But uh, as so often happens in the book of Revelation, we catch it from a different perspective. There's a there's another pulling back of the curtain, as it were. Look with me at verse 10. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Mountains are significant in the Bible, uh, great high mountains even more so. And typically they're associated with the the presence of God. And so John's taken to this mountain and he sees this, this bridal city described as holy and coming down out of heaven from God. So the city itself comes from heaven, from the dwelling place of God. And in a way we've been kind of expecting this Uh, Not only did we see this picture of this bridal city in chapter 21, and he helped us look at that last week, but even back in chapter 3 of um, of Revelation, Jesus himself said, The one who is victorious, I will write the name of my God and the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming from heaven. And so we've been expecting it, but what do we see? Well, look with me at verse 11. And John here describes this city, he says that it shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. And at first you might think, well, this is just simply, it's a description. He's describing the the purity and the brilliance of the city. And, And that's right, it's not less than that, but it's more than just a material statement. You see, this language is taken directly from Revelation chapter 4 verse 3 and you remember we're in entering the throne room of God and John is given this vision of the throne of the one who sits upon it and how does John describe it well he describes the one that he sees in this way the one who sat there on the throne had the appearance of Jasper You see, the very language that's employed to describe the glory of God as he sits upon his throne is here used to describe the city, the bride. And so as John now sees this city, he sees the very glory of God himself. In a sense, they're indistinguishable. God is present in and amongst his people. It says in the original, um, it says that uh, it doesn't say just shone with the glory of God. But describing the city, it says the city has the glory of God, having the glory of God. Now, John's not confusing God and his people, but in a very real sense, in this vision, John sees the glory as one and the same. And the description continues. Look at verses 12 to 14. Uh, The three gates on each side is, is picked up again from the book of Ezekiel. Uh, But this time the names of the apostles are added. The repeated number 12 in verses 12 and 14, we've seen this frequently throughout the book of Revelation. And there's this idea of completion, of totality. You'll remember in chapters 7 and 14, we saw 12 times 12, the 144,000 people representing the whole people of God. And here we see 12 tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. It's It's the perfect church. It's God's people from all time and all place, every tribe and tongue, Jew and Gentile, man and woman, slave and free, black and white, brown and every shade in between, old and young, once marred in sin, blackened by immorality and rebellion, but here purified and radiating with the glory of God and complete in perfect unity with one another. See, what John sees is no no separation there's a there's a there's an equivocation actually one and the same at least in the language that John uses God in his people and his people in God and and if you just think about this for too long you actually can't 
get your head around it. Sinners like you and me described in the same language as the Lord of glory, the weighty one, the sinless one. But that's the whole message of the Bible. That's what Jesus came to do, to rescue a people and to unite them to himself, to indwell us by his spirit, to perfect, to perfect us all for the praise of his glorious grace. Reminds me of Ephesians 2. Consequently, he says in verse 20, consequently, in light of Jesus' death uh, and resurrection, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God, with God's people, and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together as it rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by his spirit. Brother or sister, is this how you think of yourself? As part of a, a holy temple, spiritually united to the holy and beautiful God and, and supernaturally connected to other believers? Because this isn't, it's not just your destiny, this is our reality right now, today. 21st of February, as you sit in your living room or your kitchen or your bedroom, wherever you are, you are precious to him and you are Unlike the cliches of the world, you truly are part of something bigger. You're part of something magnificent. And you might not feel glorious now. Your present circumstances might really be bleak, whether ill health or loneliness or bereavement or a real creeping sense of anxiety and disillusionment. But brother or sister, if you're a Christian, then you are spiritually rich beyond all compare. And your circumstances aren't what they seem, at least to the human eye. And God wants you to know this. He tells us in Ephesians 1 that we've been marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So you've been given a guarantee, a deposit. And I wonder if you're struggling with this truth, uh, why not? Pray, ask the Lord, meditate, read over Ephesians 1 and 2 and these passages and ask God to make this more real to you. That you might see uh, through these temporal circumstances to the reality of who you are in Christ. But we do worry and we do fear, don't we? This life is it's not impervious to danger and upset. The world around us is changing rapidly. Stable institutions seem to be faltering and the financial system and our economy seems shaky at best. Death feels at our door. And so we ask the question, where on earth can we find security and stability and assurance? And it's in the next part of our passage. God's place permanently and perfectly on earth, verses 15 to 21 quick bit of pop quiz. What do York, York City, Lincoln City, Jerusalem and Gondor all have in common? York, Lincoln City, Jerusalem and Gondor. Anyone guessed it? They all have walls around significant parts of their city. And it's obvious why in the ancient world no wall means no protection. Enemy invaders, they come in and they steal your sheep or your grain or your wife. The bigger the wall, the greater the protection. And in the following verses, we, we do, we, we read about a great wall, a great thick wall. But is that why this wall is here? Is that what God wanted to communicate through John? Because we've already seen in the previous chapter that God's enemies have already been destroyed. We're told also later on in verse 25 that, that one day the, the gates of the city, they'll never be shut. And so essentially a wall for protection is no good if your front door's open. So what else could these numbers and measurements represent? Again, these verses draw heavily from Ezekiel's vision. And in that vision, the angel with his measuring rod, uh, he measures the outer walls and the inner sanctuary uh, and, the, uh, and the temple building itself, as well as the perimeter 
of the city. And so John employs this, this same language to underline one main point in this section. And it's underscored in verse 16. Look with me in verse 16. The city was laid out like a square, literally four cornered, as long as it was wide and as wide and high as it is long. So the main thing is that this city is essentially a perfect cube. A perfect cube, you know, as, as wide as it is long as it is high. It's a perfect cube, don't you get it? No, neither did I actually, uh, because my Old Testament knowledge is not quite as good as it should be. Do you remember the building of the temple in the Old Testament during the reign of Solomon? Well, you'll remember um, that as well as the, the outer court that was built, uh, there was a, an inner court, an inner room built called the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. Uh, this place was utterly unique in all of Israel. It was covered in, in the purest and finest gold. And it was the place that represented the very presence of God. No one was allowed in it except on one day of the year, the Day of Atonement. And on that day, the high priest and him alone could enter to make sacrifice on behalf of all of God's people. And what you might not have known about this holy place, this most holy place, is, yeah, you guessed it, it's in the shape of a cube. Uh, we pick this up from Second Chronicles chapter 3 and 1 Kings chapter 6. And it says this, that the inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long and 20 cubits wide and 20 cubits high. And it was overlaid inside with pure gold. And so the imagery is, is clear that's coming through. Here, this entire city, look at verse 18. This entire city was made of pure gold, as pure as glass. And so this entire city, just like the most holy place, is covered in gold uh, and it's in the shape of the most holy place. But there's more. Uh, verses 18 to 21, they, they list a number of precious stones. And these verses, they're not just representing splendour or opulence. Uh, it's more than Ernest Jones's back catalogue of rare gems. Now, the symbolism is, is rich and we don't have time to cover it all. But essentially, these stones were placed on the breastplate of the high priest when he would enter God's presence as a memorial uh, and as he would represent the people. Uh, but more than that, these stones would uh, represent the background. Um, sorry, uh, <coughs> these stones, the background to these verses also fulfill a, a judgment and redemption passage from the book of Isaiah. Uh, and God speaks to his people and he says this, this is Isaiah 54. He says, I will rebuild you with stones of turquoise, your foundations with lapis lazuli. I will make your battlements of rubies, your gates of sparkling jewels and all your walls of precious stones. In righteousness, you will be established. Tyranny will be far from you. You will have nothing to fear. Terror will be far removed and it will not come near you. And here's the point. God's very presence will inhabit the whole earth, every facet of the cos cosmos, every nook and every cranny. God's dwelling place is on earth with his people. And where the Lord is, there is no room for fear. Evil is gone. Tyranny will be far from you, he says. You will have nothing to fear. Terror will be far removed. It will not come near you. It's not a wall that protects us. It's not a wall that protects God's people or financial security or any other earthly thing for that matter. But it's the presence of God. And yes, we wait for this consummate reality. It will be fu fully, fully realised in the new creation. But we have his presence here with us now, don't we? His spirit dwells within us. And it's God's presence that truly transforms the lives of his people. And that's our final point. This last section, verses 22 to 27, is God's presence permanently among his people. In the ancient world, temples were, well, in the modern world as well, temples are the place where you go to meet God. 
you would offer sacrifices there, uh, you would receive teaching there. And so John, as he sees this city, naturally he looks for a temple, but he doesn't see one, or at least not what he was necessarily expecting. And um, we've already seen throughout the previous verses this, this rich imagery of temple uh, runs straight throughout this passage. Uh, look at me at verse 22. But John says, I did not see a temple in this city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. You see, John sees no physical temple because God himself, the Lord of glory, he, he is the temple. You see, the glory of God is so tangibly present in all of creation that there's no need for a building or a tent as a physical representation. There's no need for the mediation of any physical structure because God himself is the temple. The people cheered in verse three, God's dwelling place is upon earth. So visible is the glory of God that John records that there was no need for sun or moon look at verse 23 yes it's symbolic it has to be but the point is clear the lamb in all of his splendor shines brighter than the sun and so there's no need for it it's in this these pictures that we see a a folding in of ezekiel's vision into one grand picture what ezekiel saw as separate entities john sees as one god's place the new creation his presence gloriously fulfilling the cosmos with his people all together joyfully serving him and i think that's what verse 24 picks up on the nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it the nations will walk by its light i don't think this is a description of their mode of transport as much as it is the meditation of their hearts I think of Psalm 119 verse 5, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The light of the Lamb will be the source and the motivation of how his people live, as how the, how the nations live before him. The thinking, the desires, the inclinations of the nations, God's people, that's me and you, will be so aligned to God that everything that we do, everything that we are, will bring glory to God. It's Eden as it was intended to be. The creative brilliance of God mirrored perfectly through his creatures, fulfilling the entire cosmos, using our gifts, our time, talents in perfect unison with one another and in glory to God. The nations, the kings, all of redeemed humanity with one sole goal to bring glory to God. And you might wonder what this might be like practically. I think the answer is we don't know. We can't be specific about many details. Uh, The secret things belong to the Lord. 1 Corinthians 2 says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And so that's a foundation that we hold to. But what we do know is that it will be infinitely greater than anything that we've experienced here on earth. If you've ever experienced joy in worship of God, whether in song or reading his word or in prayer or in fellowship with his people, it will be unimaginably greater on that day. If you've experienced any sense of security or peace or joy granted by his spirit now, how much more when sin is removed, body perfected and the lamb in your presence? Our desires to to serve him and to use the gifts that he has given us for his glory will be met perfectly. There'll be no mixed motive or begrudging. We'll love neighbour as ourselves, free from suspicion or judgment or pride. And to have the full presence of the glory of our saviour, the one who chose us, the one who bled and died to forgive us, the one who revealed himself to us, and the one who walked us all the days of our life, even when we ignored him or prioritized other things, in his grace, he will lead us into his arms and forever will walk by the light of his glory. How much joy. Boring, no chance. 
don't know about you, but it makes me want to go there now. But Lord willing, we've got more to do for him here so that others might come into this same bliss. Brother or sister, don't believe the lie that this age is better than the age to come. Don't believe the lie that this age has more to offer or that you might be selling yourself short if you invest everything in preparing for the age to come. Just as I close, these, these visions are not to make us too heavenly minded that we're no earthly good, but the sure and certain knowledge that this is our destination enables us as God's people to, to live and to love in an evil and crooked world. This life's pains and sorrows, they'll give away. They'll pass away, that much is certain. And unlike the, the fleeting 12 week summer that we get in this country, those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life will live in a country with the glory of a thousand summers because the Lamb himself will be our lamp. And if you don't know him, please turn from your sin. Come to him, flee to him trust him today and if you want to know how to do that uh, there'll be an opportunity to, to to contact us because here's the double-sided promise in verse 27 nothing impure will ever enter this glorious new creation nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful who enters it only those whose names are written in the lamb's book of life let's pray Oh, Father, we thank you for this glorious and wonderful picture of this end time reality. You in your glorious presence with your people perfected from all time. Living perfectly under your rule in joyful service of you as you inhabit this entire cosmos renewed and all to your glory. Father, help us to meditate on this vision that it might uh, motivate us to to find joy even in difficult circumstances that we might honor you and live for you and father keep us uh, pressing on until the day when we see you face to face we thank you so much and we love you for all you have done and all you are in christ's name amen <laughs>
Well, that's the end of our service this evening. Thanks so much for watching, and we trust that you have been edified and encouraged by what God has shown us from his word tonight. If anything you've heard has raised any questions, or perhaps you'd like to find out more about what it means to follow Christ, then please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. And you can do that by emailing us at info at charlottechapel.org, and we'll get back to you as quickly as we can. Now, as we bring tonight's service to a close, let me finish by praying for you what Paul prayed for the Colossians in Colossians chapter 1. May God fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father, he has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Amen.